Try to notice what kind of breathing is right for the body right now. And how do you know? Well, you experiment. Try longer breathing for a while, see how that feels. Shorter breathing, see how that feels. Deeper, more shallow. And learn how to read the breath. In other words, learn how to read what the body needs. Sometimes you see the effects immediately, other times you notice it over time. And this ability to read your breath is a very, very important skill, because learning how to read the situation in your body and mind in general is where discernment comes. The sermon is not trying to clone the insights you read in the books. But it means being very sensitive to what's happening in the present moment and what needs to be done, where it's out of balance. Sometimes the body is out of balance, sometimes the mind is out of balance. And you need to get a, a sense of what balance is, what is just right. The only way you find out just right is by going too far to the left, too far to the right. and learning to read the warning signals, and then to make adjustments. Like if you find that meditation is making you sluggish, you've got to find ways of energizing yourself. The breath can help, but it's not just the breath, it's also the quality of awareness you're bringing to the meditation. For many of us, meditation is a way to relax, because we need relaxation in our lives, up to a point. Other times when we need to be energized. You see this in what are traditionally called the three levels of concentration. There's Momentary concentration, the concentration where basically you can function in life. You concentrate on reading a book or listening to somebody talk, concentrating on a particular task at hand. It's called momentary because it's not all that continuous. It'll ride for a moment and then lose it, then ride for a moment, then lose it, and keep coming back, coming back, coming back, so that you can read the whole book, say or listen to the whole conversation. That's our ordinary concentration. And that's the concentration we have to develop. You can't drop that and say, oh, I want stronger concentration and try to look for it someplace else. It doesn't exist someplace else. It exists in learning how to make that momentary concentration more continuous. You'll notice that the little gaps in the momentary concentration, those are caused by A sense of displeasure of some kind, or maybe very subtle, just boredom or slight sense of discomfort. And to get through those gaps, you have to be able to work with the discomfort. This is why we work with the breath. It gives you practice in dealing with sense of, a sense of disease and not shrinking back from it. The breath may not seem all that comfortable to begin with. Well, learn to work with it. Or there may be patterns of tension in the body. Watch them for a while and allow the quality of your awareness, steady, unobtrusive, uninvasive, to allow those knots of tension in the body to unentangle. And again, with the question of whether it's wise to be more proactive in working with these patterns of tension or to watch them, that's something you can find only through trial and error. Different types of tension in the body will require different tactics. But it's working through the tension that gets you to the next level of concentration, which is what they call access concentration. Sometimes it's called neighborhood or threshold concentration. You're in the neighborhood of the real thing. You're 
on the threshold. You're gaining access to it, but you're not quite there yet. And this is a level where people tend to drift off. It's very comfortable. Momentary concentration can't stand displeasure. Access concentration can't stand pleasure. In other words, it begins to blur out. You lose yourself. When people fall asleep in meditation, this is where they tend to fall. When they drift off into those states where they can't quite be sure whether they were asleep or awake, this is where they were. And the way to get past that is to learn how to work with the pleasure. This is why John Lee recommends spreading the sense of pleasure from the breath throughout the body, and then trying to maintain full awareness of the body all the time. He calls this waking up the elements of the body. Because that quality of full body awareness does wake you up. The breath gets very refined. And the more continuous you can make that all full body awareness, the more the mind feels awake, the more the body feels energized. And this is what leads to fixed penetration, from the, the third level of concentration, which is really solid. It's not a drifting kind of concentration, it's very solidly there. It's like you're firmly planted or plugged in to the body. And there's a quality of strength. One of the images in the text is of a, a wooden door. And most people's Bodies and minds are like balls of clay. You throw a stone into the ball of clay and you make a big dent in it. But when your awareness fills the body, you're energized. And it's almost as if there were a magnetic field around the body at that point. Things don't invade you as much as they did before. The image now is that it's this wooden door. You throw a ball of string against it, and the ball of string doesn't penetrate into the door. It doesn't make an impression. That's the kind of solidity and energy you want to develop in the, in the meditation. So that it's not just a relaxation practice or not just a stress reduction practice. It energizes the mind. Now this takes work. You have to put some energy into it in order to get the, the energy out of it. It's like running any kind of business. Business, You've got to invest. You've got to be willing to sink some money into it before you can get the profit. So you put the energy into maintaining this full body awareness no matter what happens. It takes effort. And in the beginning, it's not all that easy for some people. Some people find it easy, other people don't. But you've got to learn how to inhabit your whole body and stay there all the time. The reason is not only that it energizes you, but you begin to see the movements of the mind that would shrink. What are they shrinking from? When the mind shrinks to go out after something, why is it going out? What's, what's the attraction? In this way, while you're trying to maintain your concentration, you start getting insight into the mind itself. Alternatively, when you've had, developed a good strong state of concentration like this, then when issues come up in life, you want to use this as your basis from which you approach them. There's something you want to think through, get the mind energized, get it clear, get it fully in the body like this for a period of time. Say you've got an hour to meditate and you want to think through a particular issue, well, devote at least 50 minutes out of the hour to this full body awareness. And then you can bring up the issue. And often in the context of this enlarged awareness, you can see more sides of the issue than you might have otherwise. So 
So the pleasure of concentration is not an end in and of itself. In fact, it's one of the problems. Some people find this frustrating. They work hard to get the mind to relax, and then they say, well, you can't stay right there. That's not because pleasure is a bad thing, because it's simply how you have to learn how to use it. This is a lot of what the Buddha's teachings are about. We tend to think of pleasure or ease as an end in and of itself, and he says, no, you've got to invest it. Learn how to use a sense of pleasure you can create simply by being here in the present moment to energize the mind. So it's in a better position to see things clearly. When it sees things, then it can let go of them. What does it mean to see? The Buddha, in his description of his awakening, sets out a really useful pattern. His first knowledge on that night was knowledge of his past lives. In other words, looked at his personal narrative. He was looking at his story. Now, his story went way back. And maybe we can't remember our previous lives, but at least we can remember where we've done, what we've done in the past as best we can. So if you've got a problem in life, the first thing you've got to do is look at, okay, what led to this problem? What did you do? that brought this problem about. This is not to say that you're the one at fault all the time, but look at for your own contribution. Why is it a problem to you? Then in the next stage, the Buddha's second knowledge, he looked not only at his own life, but the lives of all beings, seeing how they died and were reborn in line with their karma and how their karma was shaped by their, by their views. What this shows is that after you've looked at your own personal contribution to the, the particular problem, try to look at things in terms of universal patterns. When other people have this kind of problem, what do they do? Have you seen other people handle this problem well? Have you seen them handle it poorly? See what lessons you can learn from those with larger patterns. And then with the third knowledge, the Buddha looked at his mind in the immediate present. He saw that how he saw how karma was so important in shaping people's lives. Well, where is the karma right now? Where is it being done right now? What is it right now? Well, it's the intention. What are your intentions right now? Are they skillful or are they not? What would be a skillful intention in this particular situation? So you go from the story to the universal pattern, and then to your intentions in the present moment. In all these cases, the Buddha used his mind and concentration as his foundation for doing this analysis, for exploring the problem. In this case, it was the problem of suffering at large. And as for your particular sufferings, the same pattern applies. So we're sitting here focusing on the breath, not simply because the breath can become a comfortable place to say it's a good place to hang out, but the sense of ease in the present moment. The Buddha said that is one of the rewards of concentration, but you can't just sit there and eat up the rewards. He says it's like getting a coconut. John Lee said it's like getting a coconut and then just eating the coconut. That's it. One coconut. That's all you've got. The alternative is to take the coconut and plant it. It becomes a coconut tree, and the coconut trees give lots of coconuts. And you plant, eat a few of those, but you plant most of them. And ultimately you've got a whole coconut tree orchard. There's a work at the pleasure here to use it as a basis for giving the mind energy, for putting in a position where it really can start looking at its problems. Now, the amount of concentration you can apply to a particular problem, that really depends on the situation. We'd like to think that we could work on nothing but concentration until we're ready to go on to insight. But problems come up in life. 
And there really is no clear line between concentration and insight. When you look at the Buddha's description of the Eightfold Path, the first five factors are simply lists. The things you avoid, the things you develop. But when you get to those last three, the ones that constitute building up to right concentration, right effort is a long formula, which involves not only just brute effort, but also requires some discernment. What's skillful? What's unskillful? What should be maintained? What should be abandoned? What should be prevented from happening? And how do you do that skillfully? That requires a certain amount of insight right there, understanding the ways of the mind. With right mindfulness, it's that long formula. Keeping track of the body in and of itself, mindful, alert, and ardent, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. That's a whole formula. And it involves some insight, too, that ardency. Again, it's the factor of right effort, which means that you're looking for what's skillful, what's not skillful, how you can develop skillful qualities in the mind, how you can abandon unskillful ones. That's an inherent part of right mindfulness. It's what makes it right. The same with right concentration. Having abandoned unskillful qualities, the mind can settle down, develop pure equanimity and mindfulness. And as the Buddha said, there's no, there's no right concentration without a certain amount of insight, a certain amount of understanding. You can't get the mind to settle down unless you understand it. So all of these factors that go into right concentration, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, require a certain amount of insight to begin with. This ability to read the situation, figure out what's right for right now. And that requires not only that you look consistently, but you learn to use your powers of judgment properly. You learn to use your powers of ingenuity properly. When something's not working, try something else. So right concentration gets you on the, the road to developing discernment. There's discernment implicit. It's inherent within the concentration itself. So it's not simply that it provides you with a still place to stay, but it's also started you asking the right questions, developing your inner sensitivity for what's right right now, so you can read situations. The better you're able to read your own mind, the more sensitive you are to situations outside, then the more easily you can read them. And for things that are hard to read, it gives you a place where you can stay and watch for long periods of time until you finally figure them out. So remember the, the pleasure of right concentration serves a purpose. One of its purposes is to give you a sense of ease in the present moment, and the other purpose, though, is to give you something to work with, to energize the mind, to put it in a position where it really can start seeing the places where it's clinging, the places where it's holding on to things unskillfully, and to figure out what a skillful way of holding on might be if you have to hold on. until ultimately you can let go. But don't let go until the work is done. So keep working at reading the breath, reading the mind. Because it gives you help in reading and solving all the problems that are causing you to suffer, all the problems that are giving you stress.